If anyone has a question, please raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, I'll maybe start with one question without maybe too much detail. I was curious, so I, I had seen this uh, early on in your slides, the um, kinetic exchange uh, before, and I, I hadn't really thought about it, but um, I mean, at zero temperature, we, there is no kinetic exchange, right? It's, it's just kinetic correlation. Could you explain this one more time? I yeah. was quite fast and I mean, does it have consequences for things like the burial theorem or other things? I, I'm not sure, I'm just... Yeah, so, um, yes, so, so normally we think about in DFT, right, whether we have um, kinetic exchange in the ground state, we think about, well, you know, if you're minimizing the cone sham energy, the kinetic energy in the cone sham, those first order, um, those first order variations are zero because we've minimized our system, right? And generally those first order um, corrections are the exchange in that situation, right? It's this exchange energy that varies um, with uh, around that minimum. But here, because we're minimizing this thing together, right? We're minimizing the kinetic piece minus this thermally weighted cone chain, uh, thermally weighted entropy piece, first order variations in this as a unit are zero. Right, and so that's kind of what we think about as the exchange, right? These first order corrections in density functional theory can be thought of as exchange. So Kx is zero. We don't have um, exchange entropy in the thermal density functional theory. Um, however, um, if you break this into pieces, that doesn't mean that you can't have a kinetic exchange here, um, as long as it's balanced by this um, entropic exchange at the same time. And so one thing that you can do is look at, um, you can think about um, looking at the temperature dependent, or sort of the temperature dependence of um, these free energies. And if you do that, you can, you can extract sort of what this is and you can say, ah, well, if this is non-zero, then this also must be non-zero for the exchange. Um, so if your entropy, if this entropy term is non-zero for exchange, which you do find, you do find that you have temperature dependence there, which is sort of another way that you can define your entropy. Um, and if you do that, then you have to have this balancing kinetic exchange um, in order to do that. So it's sort of like this, um, yeah, it's this dance between these two pieces of these first order, um, these first order changes in the entropy. So this, this is a sort of a, a very DFT way of explaining what exchange is, right? Like, oh, well, if we think about the cone sham system, but it really is um, where this idea comes from of the kinetic exchange. It's really balancing that out. Um, so in that sense- Because of that being minimized. In that sense, like where we don't, like if you think about it in terms of K, mm -hmm. the combination, like if you write your very theorem in terms of uh, yeah. K, then I guess everything is probably fine if, I mean, it but it is weird. I haven't same. really thought about that before. But yeah, so normally you would be thinking about your kinetic balancing with your potential, but here you're thinking about this free energy mm -hmm. balancing with your potential. So I think some of it just comes from being in this ensemble picture. Um, and so you're thinking about free energies instead of energies. Um, mm -hmm. Like you're not just thinking about like internal energy and you have this free energy thing. That's a good question. I should think about that. Mm -hmm. I bet, I, I wonder if. I wonder if other folks have looked at that. I can't, I don't remember if anyone's looking, mm -hmm. thought about that in particular. Um, it's a good question. Let's see other questions or comments from the audience. I mean, I don't really have a question, but I have a comment. Um, this temperature connection that you showed, um, it looks also very interesting from the perspective of path integral Monte Carlo, because in PIMC, high temperatures um, are actually not a problem. Yeah, that's true. Hi. <laughs> um, that, that's a good point. I, I know that um, Kieran Burke, who I think gave a talk here a few months ago, maybe. I don't, I don't remember time. What is time in the era of COVID? I don't. I don't remember when. He, I think he gave a talk here. Oh. He had some work on thermal stitching, which I think uses some of those ideas of connecting high temperature 
uh, methods with lower temperature methods, um, which is related to this thermal connection thing. But yeah, I think you, I think you could use that, that's sort of the idea that we had when we wrote it down is that we know that some of those methods like path integral Monte Carlo or even you know less accurate methods um, down where we care about things, less accurate methods, right? Um, have these high temperature, we have these high temperature results. What does it mean if we could bring those down um, or vice versa, right? Like seeing how things connect. Um, so that might be that might be an interesting way to do that. I mean, we kind of are in some ways, right? We're using we're using your um, some of some of your work to connect different temperature regimes by doing the scaling, the simulated scaling that we're doing already. Yes, yeah, so, well, I mean, maybe we can discuss um, how to use path under the Monte Carlo for this purpose and practice. So maybe you could go back to the slide where you introduced yeah. uh, this adiabatic approximation for the kernel. Yeah, this, this local density approximation uh, mm -hmm. thing. I think here, oops, that's not what I meant to do. How about that? This one? Yeah, that looks perfect. Uh, okay. Great. Um, so my question is the following. So in principle with PIMC, we can compute the exact um, electronic density and also other properties. Let's say at, at least for some conditions, right? Um, let's say it's some sufficiently high temperature or wherever. So my question would be, can we use this uh, knowledge that PIMC is giving us to compute, um, to directly compute, to invert in some sense uh, for the exchange correlation kernel, or if not for the kernel directly, because I suppose that the kernel depends on the cone charm orbitals, right? Um, mm -hmm. Then if you can compute this uh, chi of R, R prime and, and omega. Yeah, I, I guess, I think you could do that. One thing that's tricky, right? If we go back here, Right, when we're actually looking here, this is in terms of the difference between the interacting and cone sham. But we might, like, so if we wanted to connect it through the correlation free energy, instead of, you're talking about just sort of getting directly at, um, maybe not this object, because it's cone sham, but right, the, the exact density density response. I mean, um, the, I suppose that the exact density density response can be used um, in some sense as a glue, right? As a connecting piece to yeah. MC and DFT. Because in principle, um, at least as far as I understand it, if you plug the correct uh, kernel, so to say, into the cone charm response function, then you will get uh, the correct uh, response function chi, which I could also get with PMC, right? Right. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think if we did that, mm hmm. I think you would be able to get something here. You, when you do that, mm -hmm, sorry, I'm thinking. <laughs> um, if we if we have that there, isn't it the other like on the other slide, the next slide you had? Yeah, so uh, I think this one here. What a pre, yeah, that one. I believe, right? Since you have this tau prime temperature dependence in the delta chi. If you can somehow, I mean, I don't fully understand the limits, but if you can just work, right? If you can work in a temperature range that you know you get a good chi from PIMC, yeah, MC, and it seems little, like, yeah. Um, you are too fast, right? Because the question is, how do we get um, this chi from PIMC? Um, because this is chi of R, R prime and omega. So it's, uh, uh, it's not obvious, okay. right? I mean, what you can get with PIMC in principle is a density profile and you can apply uh, your external perturbation and then uh, compute your, your change in the density profile that is giving you a, a delta chi, but it's a delta chi of R and not a delta prime of R and a chi, right? So in this double integral, some information is lost and the question mm -hmm. is uh, how to reconstruct it. Or mm -hmm. um, alternatively, if there are some uh, straightforward way to, go, uh, to relate this chi of R, R prime and omega to some um, observable that we can actually estimate in PMC, some double correlator or something. Yeah, I mean, you can relate, I mean, you can, hmm, you can relate those to like pair densities, right? I mean, I, I don't know if that's that helpful for PIMC yeah. though. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's the... That actually would be perfect, would be absolutely no problem. All I need yeah. is, uh, yeah, I don't know, a concrete uh, relation. 
-hmm. Yeah, I think, I feel like the way Dobson explains this stuff, uh, there's a TDDFT book chapter, I think, that I'm thinking of that he wrote. I believe in there he talks about the relationship between, I think it's between pair densities and this density density response function in a pretty straightforward way. I can look that up and send that to you guys, see if maybe there's something there. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Tobias yeah, how for sure. It's a good idea. So can I ask a question to this discussion? Tobias, how do you want to yeah. get the omega dependency for the density density uh, for the density response function from PIMC? Yeah, excellent question. Um, I don't want to do that. I mean, at the <laughs> beginning, we would restrict ourselves to the static limit, right? And work our own way up from there. All right. So if, if we don't very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say that we um, estimated exactly in the omega to zero limit, then we could also estimate um, the kernel of the omega to zero limit and then make something like a static approximation. And we know some properties of such a static approximation, so I think it would already give uh, quite promising <laughs> results. But even the static limit is not clear to me because of this double uh, spatial dependence. Yeah, so the worst thing that you would have to do is uh, uh, analytic continuation. I mean, for the frequency yeah. dependence, yeah, it would be something like a nice thing. Yeah, that doesn't sound pleasant. <laughs> yeah, new unpleasant can of worms. Um, yeah, I mean, we, I remember that we had this discussion before, right, with uh, Uwe also about how to implement a functional derivative in PNC. That might be possible, but that would be a, a lot of work and only be possible for a few benchmark cases, if even at, um, at that, right? So we, we wouldn't know how it performs, how it converged and stuff like that. Maybe Michael, I think you wanted to ask something for a while. Is that right? Maybe not. I saw your video come on. You mean me? Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, it's just a just a just a general lot thinking which of which I had. So I mean. As I understand, I mean, I don't understand the physics, but I understand that you have a lot of complicated functionals depending on a high dimensional space, which you have to minimize. And um, and the question is, so so this is something we working on currently is, um, there are def, def, several formulations of which gradient you in the end use to, um, yeah, to, to, to follow, to, to get uh, the, the minimum of your energy. And for instance, in, in if you if you I mean I make a completely different topic. For instance, if you look at image segmentation, then you also can write down functionals which depend on, on a, a high dimensional space on all the pixels, and then you ask for 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 which image do I segment or something, and and the points that you can derive or formulate different gradients, and some of them perform better and the other one worse. And what will be working at the moment is uh, Sokolev gradient descent. And I just um, wanted to ask whether these, whether this is known or whether, whether such a, such approaches are, are, are used here uh, as well. So to have um, um, variational Sokolev gradient descent or something. This is something which, which pops up in this topic so, or, or not. Yeah, so I mean, I know that we talk about uh, circle of spaces sometimes, but I don't know if P I don't, I'm, that's not a little out of my wheelhouse. I'm trying to think if I've heard anyone talk about okay. that, not lately. Um, but I know that there, you know, we, there are, as with a lot of physics problems, right, there are some yeah, nice sure. convenient conditions that like make it so that our, our, um, our descent is a little con more controlled, even though it's a pretty big space, right? Um, and I could send you information on the spaces that are that we know yeah. that these um, mappings exist within. Like I, there are some conditions on bounding and things like that that are pretty common in quantum mechanics, but specific ones on the kinetic energies and things like that to see if maybe what you're doing is um, directly relevant to it. Because I, I mean, it, it quite possibly could be. I don't think that I know. <laughs> I don't think I know the answer to your question. <laughs> um, yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, 
So I mean, it's it's also somehow on on, on the list to to continue this this uh, approach with, with uh, Attila, and then then yeah, let's see whether this is somehow relevant or or not, and then we 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 can look at it closer. Yeah, I think um, that would be really yeah. helpful for like these, for particularly in these thermal situations, right, where you're really trying to drive things to convergence as quickly as possible. Exactly. Because things are brutal, right? I mean, the the, the sets are really really big, um, computationally. So if there's a way to increase that efficiency, people would gobble it up. I think. Um, I, I saw Tim came on with the video a bit earlier, but anyone else who has a question? I have a question related to that topic. Sure. Using like any gradient descent method for DFT requires you to know the functional still for the kinetic energy, which you only know in the if you don't use Kong Charm, you only can do this in orbital free DFT Attila, correct? So you can mm. only this is only possible then if you do have only free electron or like for the electron gas case. Or can you formulate also, can you reformulate such functional gradient descents also in Kuncham DFT? Mm. Do you mean because you want a direct relationship through the density? Yeah. And not through the Kuncham orbitals? Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. I think there is some, if I remember correctly, some ambiguity if you do it in the Kuncham. I think it ha has it to do. I think it has to do with the um, density, well, potential Kunshan potential density mapping. There are different paths you can take. Yeah. To or to go from, let's say, a, um, a Kunshan potential to a or exchange correlation potential to a, a total exchange correlation energy. I, I, it might be related to this, but I'm not fully sure. Uh, I, I'm, I mean, conceptually, I see it easier in orbital free DFT. But I'm not fully sure. It's definitely you know, more, more straightforward, yeah. right? I mean, I think you do, I think you have, um, yeah, I guess ambiguity is the right way to put it for, for, yeah. for um, mappings between those orbitals, those orbital um, representations and the. Because at the, yeah, because at the moment, so if you do Koncham DFT, you do a self-consistent field application, which is not really a gradient descent into my understanding, but rather something that optimizes it somehow, but does not really, um, how do I say, uh, does, not, does not really uh, know a specific direction where to optimize in. And I think this is because of the Koncham ansatz, and you wouldn't have this problem in like orbital free or like any ansatz for how to solve the orbit so where you know the kinetic energy functional. It was just my two cents, what I thought about it. Is that actually, correct? Actually, so it, it's like a fixed point iteration, the Kunshan, mm. right? And I remember now there is this paper by Kieran Berg and uh, um, Stephen White. I forgot, I forgot his first name. Uh, DMRG. Yeah. White. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, Steve, um, Steve. Steve. Steve, right. And didn't they show, uh, like, didn't they show numerical proof that the, co the Kuncham self consistent field iteration always converges? Uh, oh, okay. So that's related to this, right? I mean, it's not a gradient descent, but it always converges. Yeah, I think, I think there are two different questions there, right? I mean, not, not that I don't think what Max, Maximilian yeah. is saying Max, is Max, wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't think that what you're saying is wrong. I think it is also correct that the cell consistent field thing, if it weren't, I mean, this is related to what I was saying before, right? You have these like physical constraints on these processes that sometimes make things happier than you have the right to expect, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so, so you do have this this self consistent thing that is a like a fundamentally different thing than driving uh, a descent, but because of where you start and and sort of where that self consistent field iteration is going, you end up being somewhere. Uh, you end you end up going to a place that is a good um, spot 
to sort of circle down to with the self-consistent field. Like, I don't think that's from the self-consistent field. I think it's from, from these other considerations um, that it happens to be this fixed point. But, ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, th again, this is like, you know, not my specific area. So I might be saying these things okay. in a backwards way. Yeah, but thank you for this discussion. This, uh, because I always ask myself that why does the SCF cycle, uh, why should it converge? Well, and the, there's some people who, for similar, some similar arguments, think that this analytic continuation thing is also, which is awful, and of course nobody wants to do it, right? Um, right? Ever? Like, why? Why would you ever? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I love the complex plane. I swear. So <laughs> if we, but if we're thinking about doing that for the cone sham system, there, are some people think that, uh, in the same way that you might be able to sort of guide that, and you know, like, with these maximum entropy methods and other things like, you know, ways that you can make that go more smoothly. Some people think that doing that in the cone sham system kind of establishes that just automatically by being in that problem space because of similar arguments to that. I don't know if those are founded. I have not looked at that myself, but I've ha I have heard people say that before, um, specifically for doing analytic continuation around the cone sham system, um, which is also related to this, you know, these ideas about, um, I mean, very much like Green's function methods, right? Like there's, you can think about doing that for, for cone sham things as well. And, and um, as opposed to doing just analytic continuation, which is, you know, can be hell on earth if, if it goes poorly. There are some yeah. ideas that, that similar considerations to why you get this fixed point iteration um, happening on the other side of things that could also sort of guide that analytic continuation to be a smoother process. But again, I'm not, I'm not that's not my bag. Um, as we say over here. <laughs> All right, <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much. See, um, more, are there any other questions to our or comments for the discussion? All right. Maybe not, maybe there's nothing else. I would say let's um, talk maybe again internally, right, about the static limit of the formula that is still written here from PIMC. Uh, I think that would be interesting and see if we can maybe do something along these lines. Um, have to probably sit down and think a little bit more about uh, the details. Um, and yeah, then I would say thanks again, Aurora, for your talk. Thanks for the discussion. Thank you and so yeah. much for having me. It was really nice to see those of you I I already know. <laughs> and I appreciate the good discussion and the insights very much. Yeah, thank and you. Thanks much. for everyone else for participating and um, joining. All right. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Have a good time. Bye. 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 -bye.